So this evening, we'll get to hear from our librarian uh, Lim Tin Seng, who give us a glimpse of his research on the greening of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lim Tin Seng. Many of us have this impression that the greening of Singapore began in 1967, after we launched the Garden City Vision. But if you have the chance to look at some of our historical sources, the greening actually started back in the colonial period. In fact, we can actually break it down into these following areas. Creation of the botanic gardens, the establishment of nature reserves, tree planting, and the creation of recreation spaces. Okay, when you talk about the botanic gardens, I think the first thing to know is that what we have today in Tangling is not the first botanic garden, right? The first one was actually conceived back in 1822. But this 1822 garden, it was, con it was actually put forward by Nathaniel Wallich. So the purpose of that garden was to build up this botanical collection of native plants. That's native to Singapore, as well as to cultivate commercial crops. So when they put forward this idea to Raffles, all right, Raffles was pretty aesthetic. All right. He also allocated a, quite a huge piece of land, a 19 hectare land that stretched from the northeastern slopes of Fort Canning all the way to today's Mount Sophia. So with that, we can move on to today's garden. That's the Tanning Garden, all right? Just, I think uh, everyone should know how it was established, right? Especially after the garden was received its uh, UNESCO status, right? Anyway, just to recap, it was established in 1859, and it was uh, by this agri-horticultural society. The purpose of that garden was a bit different from what we have seen so far. Okay, it was be a landscape ornamental garden, a leisure park as well as to study horticulture and botany. And to design this, they actually hired Lawrence Niven. And how he designed this garden was based on this English landscape movement. It's about being in harmony with the natural environment. So we are talking things like rolling landscape, curving roads and paths, plantings at different heights with a mix of trees and shrubs. And this map actually shows all these elements in our potent gardens. And in fact, today, if you go there, you, know, you can actually see it very clearly. Now, when we talk about nature reserves, it is actually linked to the deforestation of the island. And this problem, as we have seen earlier, right? You see that after they relax the land ownership law, there was a proliferation of plantations. And that reduced the forest cover from 82% to 60%. So by the 1870s, 1870s, only 10% were left. When the government finally took action in the 1870s, they did not take action because of these environmental problems. All right? They took action because they were worried about the diminishing supply of timber. And we have to do something about it. We have to set up nature reserves. And that job was given to Nathaniel Kennedy in 1881. Kennedy actually started identifying where the reserves were. In his report, there is this map that shows where the reserve might be. And he was able to identify 14 reserves in 1886. One thing you have to know is that they, are, they were not fully covered with primary forests. In fact, most of them were actually wheat-covered wasteland. And that was because back then, all these areas have already been cleared from plantations. So for, because of that, they actually spent a lot of their time during the forest department's formative years to reforest these areas. Well, it's, it's a very difficult, challenging task, but the government kind of ran out of patience because it was pretty expensive to do so. So what happened is they took back the lands and they passed it on to, of all places, the land office. Now the land office did it and introduced the forest reserve ordinance all right, in 1908, but they didn't really care about it. All right. So what they did is they kind of uh, parcel out the reserves for various projects, including um, in Changi. All right, the Changi reserve was carved out and was a, mit a military base was built. And parts of Bukitima was also, were also given to quarry miners. All right, so today, yeah, we have all this Bukitima reserves, central catchment, Labrador, and Sunai Bulu, that's a crunchy reserve. 
Okay, train planting. Okay, this activity is something that we associate very closely with our Garden City vision, right? We always talk about train planting. But one thing that I found out is that there was just so little written on its colonial history. But if you look at the municipal records all right, and newspapers, what you can find is that this activity actually started around 1860s. So you can actually find roads like Stanford Road, River Valley Road and Orchard Road were already planted with trees and they were considered one of the finest. This practice was already widespread in the United States and Europe, so it's nothing new. And, um, and in 1925, they actually launched a tree planting program with the Singapore Botanic, Botanic Gardens. And some of the roads where trees were planted was uh, Jalan Besar, Scotts Road, Stevens Road, Bukit Timah, and Capital Road. And also, this tree planting was not just colonial tree planting was not just confined to just the road size. In fact, the Singapore Improvement Trust actually planted trees in their estates to beautify the place. So what is this Garden City vision? You know, it's a change transform Singapore from a concrete jungle into something that is that was that is covered with lush greenery. There is uh, actually an economic perspective to it, and there was, if Singapore were to become a garden city, it shows that Singapore was, is, a well-organized city, and that will attract tourists and investment. And how they implement this is through two stages: tree planting and building parks. The objective of this tree planting phase. It is to create avenues of trees and abundance of lush greenery. And to do so, they have this dedicated agency. They set up this dedicated agency known as the Parks and Tree Unit within the Public Works Department in 1967. So this unit was responsible for all matters related to tree planting. And this included choosing the right types of trees. You also think of ways of how to plant these trees in the build-up area, especially in the narrow streets. And the solution that I came up with is what I showed up there, creating a platform, a planting platform, and plant those trees. And this is something that we take it for granted. You can look outside, you know, we still see it today. Now, the development of this parkland uh, in the pre-1975 stage was mostly in, the form of upgrading, mostly in the form of upgrading existing ones. During this period, at least seven new parks were built, and some of these were here. We have uh, Mount Faber Park, Central Park, that's Fort Canning, Topayo Park, and East Coast Park. East Coast Park is the best. All right? It's actually our largest park even today. It's 185 hectares. So towards the end of the 1980s, the government started to think how to, how to um, advance or how to heighten this uh, Garden City impression, this vision. And the way they do it is they introduce this green-blue plan. This is part of the 1991 concept plan. And the idea was to turn Singapore into a huge playground, all right? And one way to do it is to introduce green corridors where you connect all the parks together so that they can, uh, the users can travel from one, one park to, to, to another. And that's what we know today as the park, our park connectors. And uh, after, since it was introduced in 1990, it has grown to 300 kilometers. So pretty impressive. Uh, I just have a curious question. Um, Natalie Kenley report has uh, get, uh, proposed a number of sites as forest reserves. Um, just because I've not, never seen the map before, but um, how many of those proposed sites actually become uh, forest reserves in the early 90s? What I show up there, the 14 nature reserves, they were the nature reserves. All right? But it was, it was not gazetted as nature reserves until 1908. That's where the nature for Forest Reserve Ordinance was introduced. So these are the 14 sites. Actually, there's one site called Military, all right? But then uh, it was used as a nursery, and eventually it was, uh, it, by 1900s, it was not there, all right? It was removed.